and I took over the shepherding about 30 years ago. And I think the first 10 years I was just amazed because it's so ancient. It goes back, so way back. I just love being part of that. Hi everyone, and welcome back to Gay Chill Crafts. I'm Sarah, and today I'm at Broadbrook Mountain Farm in Royalton with my friend Rebecca Began. Rebecca, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, I've been trying to get Rebecca on camera for a little while here. Um, she lives. <laughs> she lives up a dirt road. <laughs> and now, it's hard to get to. Mud season now. Yeah, mud and, season, uh, snow, ice. You know the whole but, thing. You know, it, maybe it's the second day of spring. Yeah. Yesterday, today. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we know officially spring happened a couple weeks ago, but that doesn't count no. when you're in Vermont. <laughs> <It doesn't. laughs> um, yeah, so um, Rebecca has a multifaceted um, artistic and farming background, so we're going to cover a lot of territory today, but I want to start with sheep um, and your experience as a shepherd. So how did you get started and when did you get started with sheep? Well, um, shepherding came as a total surprise. I, it was nothing I sought out. Um, it's something that opened up when I started helping the wolves on this farm. Mm -hmm. And I took over the shepherding about 30 years ago. And I think the first 10 years I was just amazed because it's so ancient. It goes back so way back. I just love being part of that. Mm -hmm. And then after 20 years, more of the same, except it was like 20 years. Now yeah. I'm going on 30 years and... Um, Starting to get the hang of it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, or I'm beginning to understand um, in the UK they have a term called hefted for the flocks that go up in the dells um, all over and then come back. And, and I mean, just eons of, of flock there with the shepherding families, and it's called hefted. And maybe now I begin to respect to understand what that concept means. Mm -hmm. It's a, a term that means tied to the land, right? One Just, yeah, in being one there. Uh, and I've been part of this mountain now for 30 years in this flock and it makes me understand what they've been going through. Yeah, and I think the sheep do too. I mean, even in a microclimate, I think over generations they get accustomed to the hay and the climate and definitely all this of that. this flock is and to their range because in mm -hmm. the summer they go down to electric fence but good sized pastures uh, where they get to roam mm -hmm. this is probably the closest I am to them during lambing they right. they get used to me just around all the time so they don't care yeah we had a limited way to set up the camera so we weren't in the mud so uh, mm -hmm. if you hear or see Lambs, you might catch a glimpse, but we'll show you some close-ups as we're talking so you can see all the, the new lambs that Rebecca has on the ground today. Um, and the variety of sheep that you raise is Romney. This is Romney, and it is a breeding flock. It is for genetics, and mm -hmm. it, it is the old-style Romney. The breed is getting bigger, so can't help but get a little bit bigger, but because um, people are concerned about the meat, you know, having a good good weight mm -hmm. so who cared in in the past about eating a scrawny lamb or you <laughs> right anyway so um they are a little bit getting a little bit bigger but uh we really try for the outside bloodlines and to keep a strong genetic base mm -hmm. i don't know if anybody cares but we do <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, i think people do <laughs> Um, and I've, I've talked to some other shepherds that, you know, there aren't very many of you all that are raising the old style Romneys, but a couple of you that are very passionate about it. And I think right. it's important, um, because sheep breeds were originally developed in certain ways to take advantage of their climate and to have a good balance of wool and meat. And I think it wasn't until really World War II that, especially over in the UK, that they started eating lambs. You would never have eaten a young sheep no you need wool mutton was too, too valuable <laughs> and now of course the the right. wool market's struggling especially yeah. in the u.s and so people do eat lamb um, right. but that's one of the ways to keep the keep the breed going is to breed for, for these came from southern england from the marsh new forest the marsh romney marsh mm -hmm. so they're acclimated to wet underfoot which is great here right uh so yeah yeah, in Vermont, you have your choice of steep, rocky outcrop, very little vegetation, or um, kind of mixed or variable s 
spots with very mucky wetland areas. <laughs> yeah. You get better hay that way. So they got good feed. They yeah. got good feed. Yeah. They're hardy, calm. They're very mm-hmm. calm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good so. mothers. Oh, excellent mothers. Mm-hmm. And yep. uh, and their wool is really nice. I brought a skein. So um, a little while ago, we bought some uh, fleeces from Rebecca and took them to a mill. This was spun by Hampton Fiber Mill, and this is the undyed Romney. And I just want to talk a little bit more in depth about the, the wool characteristics because we have a lot of knitters and uh, spinners mm-hmm. that watch the show. Um, <clears throat> so Romney is a long wool, right? Most That's long right. Wool. That's right. I mean, yeah. some people do shear twice a year, but we don't find that cost effective. So it's the full staple length, but mm-hmm. not all that many mills take it. Right. Um, very, very soft. Yes, very soft, um, very lustrous. It yes, takes it dye up. really well. It's not quite as shiny as like a blue face luster, but mm-hmm. it's it's kind of, I would put it in that same vein. Um, and because you have the long staple length, all the fibers are running in one direction, and so you do get a nice smooth, uh, soft finish mm-hmm. on the yarn, even though I think Romney in some cases can have a reputation for being a little rough, but I, I actually think that's the upbreeding. And the crossbreeding that's been going on to make them bigger is that it they're losing that. It could be that. It's. I think it's also whether you feed them a lot of grass or whether they grain. Mm-hmm. The, I think the grain changes it because um, I've had uh, folks that say, oh, I don't like Romney wool. Mm-hmm. In fact, we have a friend who said, oh, I don't like Romney wool. And then she wanted a fleece for demo and I sold her a fleece real cheap and she went, Whoa! <laughs> well, I'll take it all back. So right, right, yeah. yeah. So. I think it really depends on the the individual yeah. genetics and, yeah. like you said, and the diet and and all of that. So you can have quite a range between breeds, but they're they're a good uh, multi-purpose breed. Um, so if you're looking to get into shepherding, and especially if you want white wool um, to over dye, mm. it's it's a nice option. You get a lot of um, how how big are your fleeces on average from adults? You get a lot of wool, I think. From, well, a good ten. I mean, yeah. I, I skirt away a lot, and I just keep the about five to seven. Mm-hmm. So yep. yeah, but compared to a Shetland, where you might get you know two or three pounds, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. a Romney is a nice a nice yield. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. There's some bouncing lambs yeah, going on. Yeah, we'll, some bouncing we'll, lambs. We'll make sure we get some good footage for you guys. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so you came here, and you were inexperienced as a shepherd. Totally. Yeah. With, um, Holly Wolf read it from a book herself it was her mother who started the flock when they retired with her father but then her father got ill so really the mother was taking care of it and then holly th- saw things going to rack and ruin and she just said well she sort of just came and started fixing things up and managing the flock and read and sh- building this barn with a friend from a book what do mm-hmm. you need right so um <laughs> Free youtube you get a book yeah <laughs> so um then when I came along and showed interest, mm-hmm. which certainly she tried to interest me, oh, see my sheep, um, I was gung-ho and I said, sure, I'll do it because it wasn't her first love on the farm. Mm-hmm. She wanted to manage haying, so I took over the shepherding. The animals, yeah. The main, main yeah. shepherding. It's my first love for sure. I think, and having animals on the land really helps preserve the landscape. It's part of that too. too. It's part of that. It may not be... May, you know, it's obviously it's not making money. Um, can't make a living. It's it's part of the living landscape, the dedication on this farm mm-hmm. to doing that. So. Yep, yep. So and you all and she was into Romneys already at that point. That's what Is her that mother right? had. Her parents had got yeah. because there were lots of Romney flocks back then. Uh-huh. Uh, well, they got there sixty five, but even before World War Two, that was the popular thing after Marina. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And it was, it was really uh, 70s, 80s that people started to bring a more diverse uh-huh. flock situation to Vermont. Uh-huh. So there yeah, were lots of Romneys back, back then, flocks. Right. And did you all um, have support from other local shepherds? I don't, I'm not even sure the Vermont Sheep and Goat Association. No, no, we, we were founded. We've been part of that. that. Holly went with the early folks. Uh, yes, she had a community of shepherds, Susie Wallace mm-hmm. down in, in Norwich for one, and um, who was a pioneer at the Norwich Farmer's Market mm-hmm. with, with fiber arts and didn't get much respect. You know? 
you know, and it's she hard just, to be the new guy. Well, yeah. she just, kept, you know, so if, if, if it's going boom now, it's thanks to people like that. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, they did, they would go look for ramps together. They went to workshops together. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one of my things is a, a still relatively new shepherd. I mean, we've been doing it for 11 years now, but you know, that's one of my big things is find yourself an experienced mentor and really make sure that you have good chemistry with them and you know that um they're willing to help you because i think there's nothing like it <laughs> right having that personal touch and that person you can call at midnight going my you's doing something really weird and i can't tell if lambing's going right going according to plan or not right. and can you you know talk me through this yeah. with anything um you know it happened to be sheep i had this notion of doing bees mm, but then mm. i did the sheep were enough <laughs> so i did the sheep so yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know some beekeepers, but it's the same way. I mean, I think with any it, with anything. I think a beehive, like from everything I read, it's like having a flock of sheep. You're bonded. Right. They know you. You know them. What do they say? Every hive, hive or beekeeper's yard smells different. Uh huh. <laughs> so yeah. Maybe the, maybe the sheep and the shepherd smell each other too. So. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I think so for sure. I mean, I know my sheep must smell different than yours because I'll get the third degree from my dog when I get home. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And what would your, um, now that you do have this experience, what would your observations or advice be for a new shepherd getting started today or somebody who's thinking about it? Get your system set up. Mm -hmm. Get your barn, your paddocks, your where you're going to pasture them. Get it all set up mm -hmm. before you even start. And while you're doing that, you can go around and look at different breeds and talk to people and see what suits your fancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, some people don't want bigger sheep. Some people want littler sheep because they're easier to manage. I think you know these are. I wouldn't want much bigger. It, when you've got a charging you who's upset because she's in labor, mm -hmm. you have to be able to hold her. Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, get your system together first. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good advice. I know a lot of people try to do it piecemeal and they think, oh, I'll get a couple and then I'll have some products and then I'll have more money and then I can build a bigger thing or a better fence or whatever but well you can start small yeah. but just make sure it's all intact mm -hmm. and ready i agree yeah yeah and that you have a your your haying source yeah right yeah hay yeah. is really a foundation and uh, and you don't you don't grain very much if at all very little i yeah. only grain now when they're um nursing so mm -hmm. intensely for the first three weeks mm -hmm. but the hay they have is a lot of clover in it right a lot so, of protein yeah. for the for the yeah. new moms. Yeah, we're the same way. I, I was actually told by a couple of my mentors not to give grain because it coarsens the fiber. And I, that's right. I think it, that's right. We mentioned that yep. earlier. Yeah. Right. So, you know, good hay source, whether you can pay your own property or I think I think the ideal thing is to have a large property, if you can, <laughs> and have someone else hay it and trade them in trade hay. Them. Well, yeah, cause, yeah, not everybody can haying is a thing yeah if, it's a whole if, job unto itself we we've hayed here because that's how it was and holly got the equipment and it's the same equipment and so we do it we're very dedicated to doing it it's mm -hmm. all part of our our circle cycle of but um yeah it's kind of like sailing mm -hmm. when people have a sailboat it's a huge commitment it takes a lot of maintenance and when you get out there you got to go mm -hmm. you can't Hangs a lot like that. You just get out there. You gotta, you gotta finish it. Right, and you're you're yeah. completely dependent on the weather, and you have to be a good weatherman, weather so, woman. Yeah, you. <laughs> and then even so, you get right. You get surprised, uh, or you do. Yeah, you do. Yep. So speaking of the the art and craft of hang, um, that takes us on into another craft of yours, and that's writing. I do write. Yeah. Um, that's what I do in the deep winter mm -hmm. when. <laughs> when all the snow and the blizzards and you got to stay in, I, I have about six to eight weeks where I can just really focus in that headspace that's so hard to get into anyway. Uh -huh. And I write because yeah. I've always written. So I write. That's great. Right. And I did write a book about haying, our experience of haying, mm -hmm. um, that I it, give out. <laughs> <laughs> you sell it I too. Give. Yeah. So people can buy it. We'll link to Rebecca's website where you can order a copy. And it's called Hang Time. Yep. And uh, you do cover the history of Hang a little bit. You touch on it and how it intersects with your experience on this farm. Right. Um, but then just, uh, it's almost, 
it's almost an ode. It's almost an epic tale in the way that it's written. I would say your style's very lyrical, and yeah, and uh, and so there's these prose. scenes. Yeah. It's <laughs> prose, these, but these yeah. scenes of um, of of different snapshots, different time periods, uh, different eras with different you know different tractors, mm-hmm. things like that. So it's um, it's not like a chronological report or an account in that way, but it's it's just no. very beautiful. It's like a it's like poetry. Uh, Farm poetry, I would call it. Maybe that's how I write because I've recently I've done a couple of um, myths. I'm doing myths. Oh, that's great. Matriarchal myth. Mm-hmm. Uh, thought we're kind of lacking that. <laughs> yes. Um, different right kind now. of action heroine, different kind of wise elder women. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I've created this um, matriarchal myth series and. Probably to try to to get to some concepts, you know, breaking through, breaking through, go back, go back before patriarchal word, just go back, go back. Mm-hmm. So I always say you go back to song, and so I'm sure those will have a similar style or do have a similar similar style. Mm-hmm. Um, so your book, Runner for the Keeper of Song, that's the first. That's in the first this one, series. and I wanted an action heroine for yeah. young women. Yeah. And, um, yeah, positive elders, um, Mm -hmm. but it also talks about the separation from something important. In this case, it happens to be the mammoths that are leaving, Mm -hmm. and that becomes the, that mythical separation that humans have always had, and then they, they want to find it again, or they want to make the connection again, Mm -hmm. um, so... That's sort of what that, but it's just supposed to be a fun story. Yeah, it's supposed to be a story. Oh, it is. I read it over the course of a weekend. I really couldn't put it down. Um, well, that's because nice because it's it is it's very captivating. The um, the language takes you, you know, half a chapter to get your head around. Um, well, yeah, I have, a, <laughs> I have a glossary, but it's also because I want to get away from modern concepts Mm -hmm. so some the phrasing is different or i might choose a more obscure word um or just sort of the western um stamp cultural stamp on everything right right to me that really broke away it feels like you're in i want you to be somewhere else somewhere else (laughs) i mean i would think africa because that's where you grew up well talk about that a little bit certainly and and savannah but Mm -hmm. that that was in europe too Mm -hmm. so um it right. could be anywhere, but it's just very, very early on when people weren't making weapons. They mm-hmm. were making tools. And, right. um, and they didn't live in huge groups. They lived no, in small groups, smaller, familiar moving groups. Moving mobile groups. And, yeah. um, so, and I use the word era mm-hmm. for, I, I don't even want to use the word woman. Mm-hmm. I don't even want to use the word man because our modern concepts of what that means, it, I want it to get away from. Yep. So it's era and rara, mm-hmm. and um, try. It, they have a different. What it means to be an era is different from mm-hmm. a, a modern co- concept of woman. <laughs> right. So I wanted to get. So I had to. I had to make up words. <laughs> right. I love it. I love it. So yeah. But it does help. It helps you get into that setting in that time period, that you know Neolithic or prehistoric time frame. Right. Helps you switch your brain off. And, and you know. Get into this it. This is even before shepherding. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So. They don't have they, they <laughs> they're, they're even, hunter gatherers. Right. They they seem to do a little cultivation or they know when things are in season, but they don't right. farm on a right. large scale. And they, no. It's yeah. pre agriculture. Right. They go around and well, just, just harvest get things. Way back. <laughs> right. In our right. De- in our That's depths great. too. Yeah. And um, I love the um the way you handled um the wise woman, but it's not a wise woman. It's three women. Three. The singers, um, right. Yeah. And the they mem- singers of memory. Represent the three stages of uh, womanhood by right. age. So you have a maiden, uh, a mother, and an elder, elder. figure. Right. Yeah. What, um, how, how did you come up with that? Or how, well, I, how this was is that your, your, in the your story? mother. I'm, I'm a friend of Sarah's mother. <laughs> um, it just came. Mm hmm. Uh, my exercise was uh, instead of that bearded, white-haired guru outside a cave on a mountain mm-hmm. that in all the cartoons, I put a woman there, mm-hmm. and I said, 
she's sitting in front of the cave. Okay, what happens now? Mm -hmm. And boom, that's what happened. Yeah, <laughs> but but there's three of them. There's three individuals. Yes, there are three of them. Yeah, right. And they're, I guess they're sort of elected or appointed by, by their group. Then they start choosing each other, their own. Right. So my next book is about trying to get back to these were supposed to come from all the era. Uh huh. What has happened that they choose their own and and they choose weakness. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So we'll look forward to yeah. to that exploration. Yeah. And uh, yeah. But I liked I liked the idea of the fluidity of the role because. The, there's this choosing of partners, but it's not a lifetime no. partnership. And so you might you might have a same sex partner for a while and then you might choose to have children well, or you might this go goes back, back and to forth shepherding. Or whatever. Yeah. It's in season. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, the sheep go breed in November and they have their babies in the spring and, and in these clans it's it's based on my shepherding experience. The Aira and the Rera might get together for the winter breeding. Right. And the rest of the season, it's a taboo because the, the children would be born in the wrong season when it's mm -hmm. hard to feed them. Mm -hmm. So then it's fine. Aira with Aira, Raira with Raira. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I like that fluidity because yeah. I think I think that is true even in modern society. If people will allow themselves to embrace that or, or look at that. But well, it's something that is kind of pushed aside or taboo in our culture. But I think... Anyway, I think a lot of people, a lot of people that I know sort of feel that. that, that there, there's a gender it's, continuum. It's, yeah, it's a flexible yeah. thing. So I'm glad yeah. that you incorporated that into your story. Yes. Oh. So we right. mentioned that you grew up in South Africa. Right, right. As a, a child and a teenager. Right. My parents are missionaries. Yep. That was another thing. The shepherding, having heard that all my life from my father, the good shepherd, well, Wow, uh -huh. that's been a wonderful that's been a wonderful part of it too yeah but yeah i've always liked african music so on our local neighborhood radio sh show uh, um i do african music mm -hmm. because i i like it so I share it yeah yeah that's great and i yeah. i know people who listen to your your program regularly and really enjoy it i mean it's different right you're in vermont which is sort of homogeneously white i think we're 95 percent <laughs> Well, there's a lot of stuff on the show you wouldn't hear yeah. otherwise. And that's right. what's really nice about this little community radio station. It's experimental. It's neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I would love it if, you know, there was somebody who came along and said, you know, I know Asian music backwards and forwards, and I'm going to play. You know, it would really be great if we had that, right. that diversity. More. But anyway, I try to play from all over Africa, all kinds of styles, all for the last, yep. you know, since recordings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, different eras, yep. uh, modern, modern yep, stuff. Contemporary. Um, but also some classic stuff. Yep. Yeah. So any any particular bands you've been or artists you've been into lately we can point to? I'll point I'll link if they have videos on YouTube or something, I'll link them up in the show notes for uh, you. Ah, well I like Malagasy music. Madagascar, uh -huh. um Jojobi yep. and I uh Invisible Systems, mm -hmm. Ethiopian. Oh, they just so many. Mm -hmm. I don't know where to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hard to pick one. Great. Um, well, we'll link to Rebecca's uh, radio show because even if you're not in Royalton, it is available on the web. So you can get it around the world. And uh, great. Well, thank you again. Thanks. And uh, tune in next week. We'll have something for you. Cheers. Bye.